Hello and welcome to the Upon Further Review podcast brought to you by Field Street Baptist Church. On this podcast, your host Cody Kitchen sits across the table from Dr. John Hall as he reviews his Sunday sermon from the week before. Welcome to the podcast that everyone has missed. I know that we have been gone for a few weeks, but we're back. We're back. I think we're back better than ever. It's a new year. We're back. Same podcast. Yes. So this should be should be good. Y'all haven't missed much. Hopefully, you haven't missed us too much. Yeah, but, I'm sure people, you know, been waiting with bated breath. Oh, I'm sure the they have. Return of the uh, upon further review. Podcast. Well, if that's you. We're here, yes. and we're back, and as always, it's your host, Cody. Joined with me is the one, the only, Dr. John Hall. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> it's my favorite introduction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you, uh, on Sunday, we had a sermon with the title, The Surpassing Greatness of Jesus Christ, which was a great sermon from Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 through 19, in which we talked about the deity of Jesus Christ, and it was great. And so, as always, as we start our podcast, what are some thoughts that came to mind as you prepared for the sermon? Right. Well, I think every preacher has a potential dilemma when you're rounding out the year and the last day of the year lands on the Lord's Day. What do you want to preach? And so as I thought about it, prayed about it, thought about it some more, it just seemed to me I wanted to end the year by elevating the greatness of Christ. And it just so happens I had a sermon out of Colossians with that very title, <laughs> The Surpassing Greatness of Jesus Christ. And I actually preached it in 2009. Mm-hmm. But it deserves to be recycled. Absolutely. It's such a marvelous text. I should have just read the text and left <laughs> because it's su- such a compelling, powerful Christological text. So that's what was in my mind. You know, what do you want to say to your people? As opposed to, hey, let me share with you 12 steps to have a better year in 2024 than you had in 2023. Yeah. Why not end by exalting the greatest person who's ever walked the face of the earth, Mm. Jesus Christ? So I'm glad it worked out the way it did. Uh, I think it did just that. In the introduction, you talked about the expl- explanation of Colossians and Paul writing to the church and, you know, in those that have denied the the deity of Christ. And this was Paul's powerful statement about who Jesus was and the identity. And I even was thinking as you were saying that on Sunday of, man, to receive this text, you know, receive this letter, what, what that, as it's being read, what that feeling was like. Mm-hmm. I couldn't imagine. I mean, mm-hmm. even just reading it on Sunday was powerful. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure there was, I'm sure there was a lot of people waiting and they were, there was a lot of questions and probably confusion that that letter probably cleared a lot of it up or <laughs> at least would for me. You know, you'd um, hope. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And in that you're, you had kind of three ideas in, in, in this text. And the first one was Jesus surpassing greatness and exaltation and existence, which we see in verse 15. And verse 15 simply says, and he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And you said that it's important to note that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, as a lot of the New Testament writers have wrote. Um, within the New Testament, and you gave us some text in, to prove that, and you talk about how Paul emphasizes that Jesus is the full, final, and complete revelation of God, and that he's the firstborn of all creation, as Paul des- describes Jesus, and you also said that Jesus Christ is the perfect, absolutely accurate image of God. And so a question is, what makes Jesus Christ the perfect, absolutely accurate image of God? Well, what makes that so is that that's the declaration of Scripture. Right. And it's the declaration of Scripture in several places. And the writer of Hebrews talks about how Jesus is the the exact representation. He is the image of the glory of God. It's marvelous. And then John has, to me, the most compelling argument when he begins, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
So I think it's so important that Paul's audience understands that when they think of Jesus, they're thinking of God. When they see Jesus, they're seeing God incarnate. And Christ pre-existed with the Father. What's interesting to me is the relationship the Father has with the Son in that, yes, they're both God. They're three persons, uh, God in three persons is the way we express it. Mm -hmm. But the Son subjects himself to the Father. And Jesus talks about even in John's Gospel, I think chapter 5, oh boy, um, he talks about how he doesn't do anything mm. or say anything that the Father doesn't direct him to either say or do. Right. He's in such lockstep with God as the obedient son. But he is utterly the image and representation of God, which I think is important for us to know because uh, Jesus said, I believe, to Thomas, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so it should put our minds and hearts both at rest and give us peace that that God is not going to operate differently than the Son. And when we've seen Christ, as he's portrayed in the Gospels and in other letters in the New Testament, even in the Old Testament, it, it is a mirror image of God. So we don't have to wonder, at least in my mind, well, what is God like? Is God different from Jesus? You know, no. Jesus is God. He is God incarnate. He was with God in the very beginning. Uh, so he's, he was not created in any way, form, or fashion. In fact, sure. he's the agent of creation. I mean, there's so much you could hang on to that question about the cruciality of, of Jesus being the image of God, and he's the perfect, complete, and whole image of God. So Christ is God incarnate. It's it's incredible to think about. It's theologically so rich. And that one verse, verse 15, is just so packed with great truth and yeah. theology. And even that whole text, that Colossians text, just really elevates the deity of Christ and just takes a hammer to the, the heretics in Colossae that would argue that no way God would ever humble himself to become yeah. a man. Yeah. Paul says he did. He's the God-man. Uh, he's God incarnate. So, yeah, it, there's a lot going on there. But I think that's why it's so crucial. Uh, in such a simple statement Jesus makes to the disciples, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yeah. Yeah. It's so good. Yeah. And I love that that one verse and how you broke that down to and even in the answer because for us even as like as a church we just went through the attributes of god mm. and so we get a blessing of being able to see that through jesus mm. um, because we get to know as you already just said just repeating it of we get to know that because of jesus mm. and because of the life that he lived in the perfect life he lived yeah um, and so for me i just i look back on that on sunday i was thinking of man we and there's so many more attributes that he haven't even touched yet mm. that we get to see that because of Jesus right. and because of him being here on this earth as, as a human. Um, it's just mind blowing mm -hmm. to me, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, and just a good reminder that it is a blessing for us to be able to see God in that way. Yes. Um, and yeah, we don't have to do a lot of what the old Testament mm -hmm. <laughs> had to do in that sense to even, um, to even be in that presence. But because of Jesus, we get to see him and know him mm -hmm. as Jesus was. And so, yes. I heard a person express it like this that the Gospels tell us what the world looks like with God physically in it. Hmm. So, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John give us portrayals from four different uh, writers that's what good. the world looks like with God in it in the person of Jesus. So, that's good. Yes. We move to your second idea in verse 16 and 17, which was Jesus's surpassing greatness and primacy over all creation. And um, how in the text saying that for him all things were created. And um, 
we, we see that Paul says Jesus is Lord supreme over all creation, that he's the creator and sustainer of all that is. Um, and you even talked about that the Bible echoes that Jesus was the agent of creation. And not only is he the agent of creation, but he's also the goal of creation. And um, I thought that was very powerful in that you put that, that he was the goal, that he was the reason. And um, again, you talk about how he maintains and sustains the delicate balance necessary for life's existence. Um, and you even talked about how Paul talks about Jesus created the angels and again proving that Jesus is over creation. Um, and in that is why is it so important for Christians to understand that Christ was not created like humans? I'll give <laughs> right. you a softball answer there. <clears throat> well, that question. Uh, the large, I mean, the large line share response to that question is it establishes his absolute deity. And I, I believe I make a statement in the sermon where I talk about how at Bethlehem uh, it was, mm-hmm. yeah, it, Christ's birth in Bethlehem was not his origin, it was his incarnation. That's yeah. an important distinction. Absolutely. Because if we're not careful, we can slip into that uh, line of thinking, which is clearly in error, thinking that, well, God created Jesus. Mm. No, the Bible tells us Jesus has always existed with the Father, right. John 1.1. 1, 1. And so that's an important uh, clarification and distinction that we make in Christian theology about uh, Christ. He was not created. In fact, if anything, the Bible declares that he was the agent of creation through whom God created, through his Son, Jesus Christ, and it's through Christ that all things that were created are even sustained. And then everything was f- by him and for him. Mm. So those prepositions, I did, I gave a little English he did. Uh, nugget Sunday morning, talking about the importance of the prepositions by him and for him and how Paul very cleverly mm-hmm. uses those. And, and those prepositions have a lot of meaning. So, uh, What God did in and through his son relative to creation was for uh, Christ. Yeah. And that Christ might be exalted over all things, including and especially the angels. Yeah. Yeah. So he, uh, one one interesting reaction we find in the book of Revelation is when an angel appeared to John. John, boo, he hits the deck and starts to worship the angel. And he's like, hey, what are you doing? Mm. Get up. You don't worship me. <laughs> that's, that's essentially reserved for God. Right. Like, Get up. What are you doing, dude? Yeah, that's a John Hall paraphrase. <laughs> um, but it's to that effect that that response evoked John to worship or, or to at least fall down before the angel. The angel's like, Get up. We don't do that. Yeah. I'm, I'm an angel. We don't worship angels. So that's a good point. The reality is that worship is to be reserved for God. And not angels. So that establishes, too, that Christ is God incarnate, and we don't worship human beings, or at least we should not. Now, tell that to an American culture that has all (laughs) kinds of idols. Anyway, that's probably for another podcast. Yeah. That's my short answer to that. (laughs) Yeah, and it just, you know, saying that being in the American culture, too, it just— I don't know, and I know I'm a Christian, so it's coming from a Christian perspective, but I just don't know how you can't read this text, specifically this text, and not believe. And and I know, again, that's coming from perspective and from a minister, but I just I, it, it just blows my mind. Mm-hmm. And for me, I maybe take it a little more personal just because getting personal, I had my sister-in-law there who doesn't believe and um believes Jesus was just a good human. And so for me, I just, I don't know how you can read that text Mm -hmm. and not, and not understand and not fully see it. And and so it's just, it goes back to, I'm saying that to say, it goes back to what you you were saying of just the, the amount of uh, truth that is going into Jesus being there from from the beginning. Mm -hmm. He wasn't created. And Mm -hmm. it's important for us to know that he wasn't created. Yeah. Um, And so... 
on us. Just a good reminder for me. And finally, you talked about Jesus' surpassing greatness and lordship over his church in verse 18. And um, you talk about that throughout Scripture we're given metaphors to describe the church. And talking about the church is a body and the Christ is the head of that body. And you kind of talked about that it's not, Jesus is not like a CEO or a company, but it is a living organism. And I love that you said that and such a good reminder that the church is a living organism Mm -hmm. um, that is the head of Jesus. And you even went above and beyond and said that you're not the head of the church and the deacons aren't the head of the church and the personnel committee, but it's, it's Christ. And I think that um, is such a good reminder for all of us Mm. to know that, that we, it is literally an organism that is living and, um, you, you even say that as a result of his death and resurrection, he has come to have his first place in everything. And I thought that was a kind of a great way to sum up and um, kind of start concluding your sermon. And in that, my question is, how should we view the church knowing that Jesus is Lord over the church? Right. That question can go in so many different directions. So to start with, I would say it establishes the church as something Super extraordinary. That's kind of redundant, but uh, there's something about the church that is special and supernatural and very unique because Christ is head over all, but he is particularly head over the body, the people of God, the church. And so there ought to have... uh, in the hearts of God's people, this very special place reserved for the church. It's not a small thing to be a part of the church, the the redeemed, Mm. and the redeemed from all ages, all places, what we call the universal church. And, of course, we're a part of a local church, Field Street Baptist Church, but there ought to be something very sacred and uh, right and good and even protected about uh, the church. The church has a very special place in my life and heart, and I'm very defensive mm. of the church. It's place in my life. It's priority in my life, and a lot of it is obviously due to the fact that I have a s- unique calling to be a pastor of a church, but even more than that and more significant than that is that Christ is head over his church, and he's the sovereign Lord over his church. I, I just... It's baffling to me that we're here in the 21st century with all the jacked up problems we have in in the world today, and especially in our own country, why the churches aren't full. Mm. What's it going to take for people to find their way back to the church? And perhaps some of it falls on the leadership of the church. Uh, Some of it certainly falls on the person in the pew. I mean, maybe there's a combination of explanations, but... If for nothing else, there's no other declaration in in the Scripture that talks about, you know, Christ is head over all, of course, but it specifically talks about how he's head of the body, the church, Hmm. and he died for the church. He died uh, to redeem the ones that God would give to him according to the Gospel of John. So there's something very unique and special about the church. Um, I love the church, and it... Again, when I say I'm defensive of the church, it just there's a real part of me that doesn't I don't take very well when people are ridiculously uninformed in their criticisms of the church. And the church takes a black eye or church gets blamed for this or blamed for that. Yeah, that, that I struggle with that sure. quite a bit. But it matters that Jesus is Lord and that he's Lord of all and that the Bible says that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the ones who ought to be leading the way and bowing the knee and, and demonstrating allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ, those of us who make up the body of Christ because he's the exalted head. And I don't want to be the head of the bo- of this body or any body for that matter. It doesn't matter if it was First Baptist Jerkwater USA or Field Street Baptist Church. I'm I'm not the head of the church. Christ is. Adrian Rogers said something I thought was funny this years ago. He said that a body with no head is dead and a body with two heads is a freak. So the the body that acknowledges that Jesus Christ is its head hmm. is thoroughly scripture scriptural and 
I think, has a right and proper and high view of the church. Jesus is Lord and head of his church. He directs the church. He empowers the church. He um, enables and strengthens and gifts the church to do the work to which he has called us, which is really a continuation of the work that he set into motion thousands of years ago. So the church is a really big deal. I don't understand Christians. I don't understand individuals who profess to be Christians but have very little to do with their church mm. or a church. So if you're listening to this and you fall into that category, I doubt seriously you wouldn't be listening to the podcast, but if indeed you fall into that category, there ought to be some serious and deep soul searching. Yeah. You know, and, and if that's disturbing to you, then that's uh, C Kitchen at <laughs> uh, dot com. But I, I, that's a real conviction of mine. I feel very strongly about that, that, that God's people, if they're physically able, should be engaged in the church. And even if you're not physically able to, like, attend, there's still other ways you can help your church. Right. Support and pray and encourage, you know, those kinds of things. But uh, if you don't, if you need, you don't, I know people want a lot of reasons, but there's one mm. that reigns above all, and is that Jesus Christ is Lord over his church. He is the head of of the body. Amen. Yeah. So it's good. Yeah. Well, what are some of your final words? Well, I'm looking forward to this Sunday, uh, the first Sunday of a brand new year, the year 2024. I'm really excited about 2024 in light of the fact that God was pleased to give us a great 2023 and so many reasons we have to give him glory and praise and even thanksgiving for the really special year we had in 2023. And so in the Weeks of January, I'm going to be preaching some standalone kinds of sermons, but this coming week, I'm going to be preaching out of Joshua 24, and the title of the message is uh, A Life Strategy That Works. Mm. So if you want a strategy that works as you're thinking about how and how you want to lean in to this new year, I was sharing with you a few moments ago that yeah. some commitments I've made that I'm, I'm leaning into this year after thinking about it, praying about it, that these are three touchstones I'm leaning on, but I know a lot of people, you know, would do well to think about, you know, what, how do I want to steward this next year in front of me, assuming the Lord gives me an entire year? Right. How do I want to steward that? What strategy would work? And I'm going to give you a strategy right out of the Bible where Joshua says to the people, you know what? Choose you this day whom you will serve. Mm -hmm gods of your forefathers, gods of the Amorites or whatever, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen. And I love that, man. What, what a stand. I can't wait to meet Joshua. Um, so that, and then I'm going to talk about what, what came out of that because that's a strategy that will, will work if you'll commit to serving the Lord. So I think 2024 is going to be a great year. Then the last Sunday of January, I'm really excited about this Sunday I'm bringing back the State of the Church address. Yeah, it's going to be good. Yeah, I can't wait. Um, I'm asking the Lord to help me with that message for sure. Yeah. But anyway. It's exciting times. My final thoughts. Yep. Good. Well, I know everyone's been missing this segment. And so, as always, um, we're going to give it to John for that stupid segment. So, John, what is stupid today? The College Bowl games. Never seen such ridiculousness. Dun, 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 in any, dun, dun. any of the years I've been watching the bowl games, uh, there's, in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, you do not have to share it. In fact, I'm not going to lose any sleep if you don't share my opinion, but the bulk of the bowl games were just not very good. Snoozers. Yeah, and this this whole portal thing has proved to be a disaster Yeah, that uh, athletes could move in and out of the portal – prior to the bowl games it just was very disruptive to the competitive nature of of the games and were it not for the semifinals i, I just would have thought i can't believe i wasted this much time watching the bowl games so much so much of it was just pure stupid yep. i mean you had teams competing against other teams it'd be like me you know, thinking i can you know beat up my big brother i mean it's just i might get one lucky punch but it's stupid to think yep. um I, I don't know. I, for me, it was stupid. 
It was stupid. Yeah. I, I'd be interested in your thoughts about it. Yeah. I mean, I'll go ahead and say it. I think a perfect example is Georgia versus FSU. <laughs> yeah. That was Florida a state. Beating. That was a, I think that, that is the epitome of all the bowl games. Yeah. Um, and the cause of it, I think is stupid is the portal. Mm-hmm. And uh, we can we can get the portal and, and money just, nil deals yeah. yeah and money money is finding a way to corrupt everything that's yeah. that used to be just pure love and competition love right. of the game competition and you know and we all get fairly nauseated from time to time by the professional sports so we have we always had the the college right. Uh, the college football to fall back on as something we thought was a little more pure, but now it's just, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's and, I, and I get some of the things, why they're happening, but I don't have to like it. Right. But I just thought the bowl games, I'm like, I can't believe that, you know, I sat by my TV. and, and I, In all honesty, there were a few games I just got up and walked out. Yeah, I was like, bad. I'm going to go do something else. This is irritating. Yeah, and I, I know I'm probably old in my thought in this, but – I I have a feeling when it comes to if you're on a team, I think it's wrong that you have a you have a an opportunity to opt out to play. And I think that's something that NFL teams should also look at, which they don't, but they should, mm-hmm. that you're on a team, you know the chance you have to get hurt by playing football. Mm-hmm. You've known that chance since you've started playing football. It's a chance you take. But is it or is it worth your team getting the victory of this bowl or this championship, whatever it is. And I know the argument, and I can understand the argument a little bit of some of these guys who have had nothing growing up. This is their one chance to make it all. Um, but And I get that mm-hmm. a little bit. But at the same time, they're still taking a chance by that first snap once they get there that they're going to have an injury. And so for me, I just it's a dedication issue. I think it's stupid that there's even an option that they get mm-hmm. to play or not. But I know I'm a little old school on that. Yeah, I, 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 dis, I don't disagree with what you're saying. I, I think, it, it, every, the product certainly suffers on the field. Yeah. And I know some of the kids were quoted as saying, I say kids, the athletes, were quoted as saying, you know, they were making business decisions. Yeah. Some of them wanted to be, you know, uh, drafted to the NFL, and it's a, you know, it's a big deal. It's a big payday in sure. most cases, and. So to some extent, I, I I can understand that you got to protect your you know your best interests, sure. but at the same time, man, they need to fix that mess because yeah. it is a mess. And the and Kirby Smart from Georgia, he he nailed it on the head for me. Mm-hmm. I, his post game interview, he just said, "This is you know, I'm paraphrasing. This, this is a mess. It needs to be addressed and, yeah. and fixed." Um, actually, the most poignant. Illustration and commentary on this aggravation of the portal is actually done in a Dr. Pepper. <laughs> I was commercial. just thinking that. Very well done. The portal's out of control. The portal's out of control. <laughs> you can't take our quarterback. <laughs> but then the, the joke about, oh, yeah, you got to let your quarterback yeah. go. Dr. You Pepper. can't let go of your Dr. Pepper. <laughs> I, I feel that way. I would not let go of my Dr. Pepper. Absolutely. But, yeah, it's that, that was um, – that was a lot of that was just man disheartening. Yeah, but s- stupid for sure. Money does funny things yep. to all industries and people and organizations and uh, competitive athletics. And hopefully they'll, they'll figure it out because there's still there's still people in the in the fan base that want pure competition. Yeah, yeah. It's just the gridiron and the grit and the, the, you know, and I know these kids make tons of sacrifices and they work really hard, and I, I get that. You know, they all are aiming for the big prize, and and hats off to them. It's it's special to be a college athlete. So, I'm not diminishing that. I just sure. think, I just think, man, the bowl games this year were just some of them were just bad. It was bad. Yeah. Well, here's to football. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That was a good one. Well, as always, guys, we're so thankful for you for y'all to join us every week and um, we're excited for the this next year and, and what God's going to bring and so as always we we say make Christ known by what you say and how you live y'all have a great week yep thank you all for listening and be sure to subscribe to upon further review so you never miss an episode 
If you have any questions, please be sure to reach out to us at info at fieldstreet.com. Thanks for tuning in.